Hola. Buenos días. Good morning. Mi nombre es Wilmary Zambrano y soy de Venezuela. My name is Wilmary Zambrano and I'm from Venezuela. Llegué junto a mi hija Amelia de tres años. I arrived with my uh, daughter Amelia. Uh, she's three years old. Y mi esposo Carlos a Estados Unidos hace ocho meses. And my husband Carlos, we arrived in the United States eight months ago. Quiero hablar de la historia de Esther. I want to talk about the story of Esther. Este libro que habla de una reina que pertenecía a Israel y logró salvar a su pueblo de este malvado hombre llamado Amán. This book talks about a queen who was from Israel and managed to save her people from a wicked man named Haman. Esta historia inspiradora, llena de influencia, por la cual me he sentido tan identificada. This inspired story has had an influence on me and I have felt identified with it. Donde nos muestra que Dios siempre está en control de nuestras vidas. Because it shows us that God, God is always in control of our lives. Ella, exiliada de Israel y huérfana, She was an orphan and exiled from Israel. Y criada por su primo Mardoqueo. She was raised by her cousin Mordecai. Así me sentí yo cuando llegué junto a mi familia. That's how I felt when I arrived here with my family. Ya que tuvimos que salir de forma apresurada y sin opción. As we had to live in a rush with no choice. Con una profunda tristeza, ya que se siente el duelo de la lejanía. And with deep sadness, as I felt the mourning of the distance. Donde dejé una vida. I left my life. Dejé mi tierra. My land. Y todo por lo que me forcé por muchos años. And everything for which I worked for, for many years. Pero sobre todo, lo más difícil, fue dejar a mi familia y a mis padres. But above all, the most difficult thing was to leave my family, my parents. Ya que no sé cuándo los vuelvo a ver. Since I don't know when I will see them again. Mm. Okay. Cuando llegué aquí me preguntaba por qué. When I got here, I was wondering why. ¿Por qué a nosotros? Why us? ¿Por qué está pasando esto? Why is this happening? Estaba muy enojada. I was very angry. No sabía qué iba a hacer de nuestras vidas. I didn't know what was going to happen to us. Solo me mantenía en pie la fe que tenía a pesar de mis miedos. The only thing that kept me going was the faith that I had despite my fears. Y la incertidumbre que conlleva a lo desconocido. And the uncertainty that unknowns brings. Esther fue escogida entre muchas por el rey para que fuese su reina. Esther was chosen among many young women by the king to be his queen. Ella siempre ocultó que era judía por recomendaciones de Mardoqueo. She always hid that she was Jewish by Mordecai's recommendation. Pues más adelante ella descubriría cuál era el propósito de su vida. Because later she will discover what the purpose of her life was. Cuando se crea este decreto de que se debía acabar con todas las personas de su nación Israel, After the decree was made that all the people of Israel should be destroyed. So. Ella tuvo la confianza de ir al palacio y hablar con el rey. 
She had the courage to go to the palace and talk to the king. Sin saber lo que podía pasar. Without knowing what would happen. Pues era su misión salvar a sus hermanos judíos. Because it was her mission to save her Jewish brothers. Muchos no sabemos cuáles son los propósitos de nuestras vidas. Many of us don't know what the purposes of our lives are. No sabemos por qué pasan las cosas así. We don't know why things happen the way they do. O por qué pasan situaciones o, circun o circunstancias que vemos injustas. Why, or, why situations or circumstances that seem unfair to us. O que no las merecemos. Or that we don't deserve. Cuando mi fe está ausente. When my faith is absent. Y pienso que a veces hay que arriesgarse. I think that sometimes you have to lose everything. Para perderlo todo. To lose everything. I'm sorry. <laughs> Para ganarlo todo. In order to gain everything. Y ese es el consuelo que me motiva a cambiar mis sentimientos. And that is what my and that is what motivates me to change my feelings. Y de dejarlo todo en manos de Dios. And leave everything in the hands of God. Por eso esta historia es vista como un instrumento de la voluntad de Dios. That is why this story is seen as an instrument of God's will. Actualmente estoy empezando de cero junto a mi familia. I'm currently starting from scratch with my family. Con lo poco que tengo, pero que me hace sentir bien y muy bendecida. With the little I have, but that makes me feel good and very blessed. Todos los días me pregunto, ¿cuál será mi propósito? Every day I, I ask myself what my purpose will be. Pero luego pienso, si Dios me trajo aquí, es por su voluntad y seguiré confiando en ello. But then I think that if God brought me here, it's because of his will and I will continue to trust in it. Si estás igual que yo, hermano exiliado, if you are like me, an exiled brother, que aún no entiendes los designios de Dios, who still doesn't understand God's plan, que la fe cultive en tu corazón, may faith let grow in your heart, la esperanza que solo el tiempo te dará las respuestas a todos tus miedos. The hope that only time will give you the answers to all your fears. A tus tristezas. Your sadness. Y a esos días que no son tan buenos. In those days that aren't so good. El libro de Esther nos invita a confiar en la providencia de Dios. The book of Esther invites us to trust in the providence of God que a pesar que en ciertos momentos no los veamos, that even though at certain times we don't see it, Dios te acompaña, God is with us, te guía, guides us, y te ayuda a descubrir, and help us discover, cuál es el propósito de tu vida. What our purpose is. Gracias. Thank you. Antes de bajarme, before I leave, <laughs> quiero darle las gracias a la iglesia. I want to thank the church por todo el apoyo que he recibido, for all the support that I have received desde que llegué, since we got here. De verdad que ustedes, you really su, y su ayuda and your support ha sido muy valiosa para mi familia. Has been invaluable for my, for my family. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Una pequeña para que no. Imagine yourself 
in a busy downtown city center somewhere, maybe Times Square in New York City or the Bean in Chicago. And all kinds of people are coming and going. And you decide that you're going to ask maybe a couple dozen people, what is the meaning of Christmas? What kinds of responses do you think you might get? You might get a lot of, well, it's about love. It's about being with family. It's about slowing down. You might get an occasional, it's about Jesus. If you didn't know anything about Christmas, and the only thing you knew about Christmas is by what you observed in the stores in November and December, you might not realize it has anything to do with Jesus. And that's why it's important for us to continue to go back to the Scriptures, rehearse the Christmas story over and over, so that the meaning and the origins of Christmas do not get hijacked by some other purpose. The book of Esther is a story. It's a story about the origins of a feast called Purim. Purim is a two-day-a-year festival filled with banquets and gladness. Gifts are exchanged. It commemorates the time of when the Jewish people in a particular part of the world were saved from destruction. The book of Esther is a story. It's its own Ebenezer stone. And to acknowledge that, I'm going to place a stone on our Ebenezer. Esther is a dramatic story filled with intrigue and curiosity, jealousy, murderous plots, and comedy. As with any story, there are actors and actresses all playing their parts. And there's a lot of characters in this story, but I want to highlight five of them. There's the king, a queen, two different royal court officers that I want to mention, and the advisors, the go-betweens. Now let me set the stage for you. Once upon a time in a land far away were these people, Jewish people, in the country of Judah, who lived in the region of Judah and in their capital city of Jerusalem. And then once upon a time, an empire, neighboring empire, came knocking on their door, the Babylonian Empire, and they destroyed the city, and they carried away the elite from that city of Jerusalem into the city of Babylon, the capital of the Babylonian Empire. Well, as time goes on, another empire emerges and comes knocking on the door of the Babylonian Empire. And you guessed it. They now became the ruling people in that area. This was the Persian Empire. So the story of Esther takes place about 125 years after those first Jewish people were taken away from Jerusalem into Babylon, and then eventually Jewish people found their way in other cities, and the story of Esther takes place in the capital city of the Persian Empire, Susa, modern-day Iran. Babylon, modern-day Iraq, basically, and then Jerusalem. So Esther and her cousin Mordecai are two of the key characters in this story, and they are Jews living in Susa about 125 years after Mordecai's great-grandfather was taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. However, even though... Mordecai and Esther are Jews. They basically kept their Jewish identity secret. They are not described as outwardly, pub publicly displaying their faith at all. Now, there's another book in the Bible, the book of Daniel, which also talks about another Jewish group of people in another city 
who very much outwardly lived out their faith. But the book of Esther is quite the opposite. In fact, God is not even mentioned in the book of Esther. And Esther and Mordecai did not uh, do outwardly public displays of faith expression. In fact, it seems that Esther and Mordecai were very well assimilated into this Persian city. I mentioned there are five key characters in this story that I want to highlight. The king, the queen, two different royal court officers, and the advisors, the go-betweens. Now, the king had a first queen who didn't do what the king wanted to do, so the royal court officers advised the king to do away with her. And so he did. And so the city officials and others assembled a whole group of women to enter into a competition to be the next Persian queen, kind of like the next American Idol or The Voice. Now, Mordecai, one of the two court officers that I'm mentioning today, and a closet Jew, tells his cousin Esther, who he actually raised as his own daughter because she was an orphan, tells her to enter into this Persian queen contest. Now, eventually, time came for the competition, but it took a year to prepare for that competition, a year's worth of cosmetic treatments and ointments to be administered before the competition could even be held. So eventually, the time came for the competition, and you guessed it, Esther wins the competition. And soon after Esther becomes queen, Mordecai discovers a murderous plot to kill the king. And he unveils it. And the king rewards him by promotion of him in the royal court. So now life goes on for these two Jewish people, these two closet Jewish people. Esther lives as a queen for about five years, and Mordecai in the court office there for about five years. And after this time, another royal court officer comes onto the scene. His name is Haman. And he also, for some reason, gets promoted. Now, Haman becomes jealous of Mordecai and finds out that Mordecai is a Jew. And so he starts to plot Mordecai's demise, as well as the other Jews living in the city, as well as the other Jews living in that region of the world. Mordecai finds out about Haman's murderous plot. Mordecai becomes desperate. Mordecai eventually sends a message via the go-betweens to his cousin, Queen Esther. He pleads for Esther to speak to the king. But Esther, still a closeted Jew, is not so sure this is a good idea. The king had not called her to come visit him for well over a month, which probably means that she fell out of good favor with the king. And if she were to show up unannounced, she could be killed. And Esther is probably remembering how she got the job in the first place. That other queen, she's no longer on the scene. So she knows the threat is very real. So Mordecai again sends word to Esther. And he says this in verses 13 and 14. Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. Now, for the most part, this whole story that Esther finds herself in is not of her choosing. She grew up an orphan, a woman, and a Jew in a time and a place that made her very vulnerable. And she was told to enter 
this Persian queen contest. But eventually, Esther does take matters into her own hands. And she listens to her adopted father, Mordecai, and at risk of her life, she goes to the queen, un- or goes to the king uninvited to plead for the Jewish people. What do you think happened? Do you think the king accepted her in the court? Or do you think he just did away with her? Well, it's the story of Esther. And as I said, the Esther commemorates the salvation of the Jews from destruction in a particular time and place. So it ends well for Esther and the Jewish people. This story's ending came about because Esther made known her Jewish identity at just the right time of place and such a time as this. I noted five key characters in this dramatic story. The king, the queen, two different royal court officers, and the advisors, the go-betweens. Throughout the story, the advisors, the go-betweens, played an important function. Sometimes they counseled the characters in ways that led to harm and oppression. Sometimes they counseled the characters that eventually led them to looking very foolish. And sometimes they counseled the characters in ways that benefited other people. I invite you now to enter this story in the role of the advisors and the go-betweens. How will you counsel other characters in the unfolding story of God and God's people today? Will you carefully listen to and and cheer on those who are experiencing harm and oppression and injustice? Will you help others Find the courage and strength in the midst of tough situations and life realities. Will you support and encourage those around you in ways that might prepare them to have their own for such a time as this moment in life? Or will you play the role of the advisor, the go-between, in ways that lead to harm and destruction and oppression? Last week, Phil noted the importance of listening. Listening to the stories of others. I believe that listening was a key function of these advisors and go-betweens. They listened before they acted. Sometimes they then acted in ways that led to harm and destruction. And sometimes they they listened and acted in ways that benefited others, including the time of when Esther discovered her own for such a time as this moment in life. I have been privileged over the past 25 plus years of my ministry to listen to thousands of stories. As a camp director, I listened to campers and camp staff. As a pastor, I listened to people in the pews. As a conference minister, I listened to pastors and church leaders and young people. As a campus pastor here at Goshen College, I had the privilege to listen to lots of stories of younger adults and employees. And now, in my work in ministry at AMBS, I get to listen to lots of stories of people who are a bit more seasoned in life. Sometimes in this listening, I have heard people recall their own for such a time as this moments in life. And sometimes in this listening, I was privileged to play the role of the advisor, the go-between, that helped people discover their own for such a time as this moments, or they were in process of discernment, or I just simply was with them. Listening is holy ground. 
These, for such a time as this moment, are not easily predicted. They catch you by surprise. Esther spent a year preparing for the competition to become queen, and then another five years or so before her moment was there. Staying attentive requires patience. Staying attentive requires endurance. Staying attentive, I believe, requires reliance on the Holy Spirit to guide us to courageously respond when we are called to. I also believe these moments require good advisors and counselors along the way, those go-betweens. College Mennonite Church, I offer my own paraphrase of Esther 4.14 for your consideration and our consideration. It's the Bob Yoder paraphrase. For if you keep silent and do not listen to those around you and resist supporting and encouraging those in your sphere of influence, relief and deliverance for those neighbors will come about by other means, but you, college Mennonite, will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to the royal court of God for just such a time as this. 